today I have the pleasure of welcoming Todd McNeil from Reflect.Run and of course my awesome co-founder Colin Chartier there from Layer CI. Um, combined they have over 25 years of experience in engineering in DevOps uh, as well as as engineering leaders at top web application startups. So these experiences led them to Y Combinator to found awesome companies in the DevOps space. And they've had the opportunity to interact with over a thousand developers this year uh, from all walks of life. And based on this awesome experience, they've had some interesting insights that they've come across uh, to share about how we can get started on DevOps. And so now I'm gonna let Colin take the floor and tell us a little bit more about the fundamentals of DevOps. Yeah, thanks Lynn, great intro. So the reason that you're at this talk, of course, is that you probably want to know, uh, you know what DevOps is if you haven't been super acquainted with it before um, and also you know, learn how to get started. But before all that, we have to talk about what DevOps is uh, practically. You know, there's lots of definitions that go into academic terms, but really for a startup that's setting up DevOps, the goal of everything is to help your developers ship new features without breaking things for your existing users. And in practice, that means, you know, uh, every time you push new code to close a new customer, um, you don't want your sales demos to fail because you broke, you know, the sales demo, the thing that you usually demo, and you don't want to break things like login or core workflows. And so DevOps for a startup is really just a set of tools and processes that helps people you know, specifically software developers on your team push new code uh, confidently and be able to do that very quickly without breaking things and worrying about, you know, I didn't write this code that my coworker wrote, but how do I push things on top of it without breaking, you know, the things that I didn't write? And so the, the key question in all of this is like, when does it matter? Like when as a startup, do you care about setting up DevOps and, you know, like, when should you start prioritizing all of this? And once you do decide to prioritize it, how do you set it up? Um, and for a startup, like, you know, there's two big kind of mistakes that we'll get into in the, the next section. Um, but the, the big one that we see a lot of is people get started with DevOps and all of this automation and developer tooling uh, before they even have users or revenue. It really doesn't matter if you lose, you know, you, like you shouldn't be worrying about losing users before you have users. In the early days, it's totally fine to just push however you're used to and ask your developer to just go directly into servers and do things that uh, don't scale, of course. Um, and so DevOps for a startup really starts mattering at one of two points. It starts mattering uh, when you have revenue and in particular when you've had your first you know, failed sales call or your first uh, churn because you know, a customer was so disappointed in the downtime or the you know the things they rely on breaking that they've left or when you hire your generally second engineer um, you know most founding teams have the person building the product on them and the second you go from having someone that knows everything to having someone that doesn't know everything um, you're, you're basically not going to be able to hire a developer unless that developer has systems in place to make sure that they can make changes without constantly needing to go back to the person that wrote the original code uh, to ask them whether their changes are correct or not. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the, there's two big common pitfalls that people do. One is they set up DevOps too early, so they, they waste time. The, the problem with DevOps is that it solidifies things, you know, kind of by its nature. So if you set up DevOps really early, um, you're going to get too attached to things that it might be best to throw out. Before you have product market fit, for example, um, if you solidify your processes and your development workflows and your product and, you know, all of your core workflows, um, it gets, you, you kind of get attached to them and it's more difficult to throw it out because not only do you have to throw out the code that, you know, your team worked on, you also have to throw out the uh, infrastructure around it, like the tests and the, you know, uh, the automation and the workflows. And so uh, getting started too early is a problem, but also getting started too late is a problem because DevOps is really an incremental journey. Um, so you can't say, like, we'll wait till we have a million dollars in revenue and then we'll set up DevOps. We'll hire a DevOps person and get it, you know, get it going. Um, because, you know, it's hard to get to a million dollars in revenue if you have 3% churn. Um, you know, if you have 7% growth 
and 3% churn, you're having your growth rate. Um, and second of all, like if you, um, if you wait too late, it's hard to even get all the systems put in place uh, all at once because there's many different parts to DevOps. Um, and you know, the implementation timeline really has uh, very distinct steps. So in the really early days, before you have revenue even, um, you might just have some unit tests. And unit tests are just little scripts that you run to evaluate that you know, very core functionality works. If you have uh, a web app, you might test that you know, the core buttons on your web app work. And you can test that like, you know, what happens when you click the button um, in a very atomic way, you know, just clicking the button, not caring about everything else that's running. Uh, you can make sure that that works. And that's fine for the early days. Again, if you break the button, it's not the end of the world. Uh, usually you don't have that many developers and it's easy enough to fix. And you know, if you don't have revenue, it's not the end of the world if it breaks for a bit. Um, and then uh, the second stage is setting up continuous integration and end-to-end -end tests. So that's really where uh, Todd and our companies you know, come into play. And continuous integration is kind of a scary buzzword, but really what it means is run you know, a script every time a developer proposes a change. And that script usually has something to do with, you know, check that the code quality is good, um, you know, use some magic to make sure that uh, there's no obvious, obvious bugs with things like linters, um, and uh, run the unit test that you've written before. Because, uh, you know, once you have a few developers on the team or you're pushing a lot of code, you might forget to run your tests, like run the scripts that make sure that everything is working properly. And if you can run them automatically, you'll know exactly the point at which you broke something. So it'll save you a lot of time uh, going back and breaking things. And then later on, you know, uh, as your team scales even beyond that, there's things like app application performance management, uh, APM tools, and you'll see things like Sentry and you'll see things like Datadog here. But really that only makes sense for, you know, teams of at least 15 developers, because there's a lot of maintenance overhead to maintaining these tools. And um, like most of the time, you can find the bugs yourself. Uh, if you're if you have a if you have few enough customers, you can just ask them to screen share with you, for example. Um, and then even further beyond that, you start caring about things like code coverage, which is you know how much of my infrastructure, like you know how many of all of the lines of code are tested by a script. And then you can get to things like 80% test coverage, which means that you know 80% of every line of code uh, has a corresponding test that makes sure that you know a new developer that's hired doesn't break that line of code. Um, and around that time, it starts making sense to hire a dedicated DevOps person to you know start setting up all of these workflows. And at that point, it stops being you know the founder or the early employee's uh, responsibility, and it starts being you know a full-time professional uh, you know, job. And uh, for now, we're going to focus on that second one. And so I'll pass it over to Todd, who's going to do a, a demo of setting up end-to-end -end tests with Reflect and, and integrating that with Layer CI, of course. Great. Uh, thanks, Colin. Um, so uh, what I'm going to show you now is basically an example application uh, and uh, show you how you can integrate Reflect and Layer CI into it to accomplish what Colin was talking about, this uh, CI continuous integration. Um, you know, to get coverage, get confidence that every change that you make uh, is not going to have a severe impact on your users. And so um, we're going to switch out here to um, first show you our example application. And so uh, here what I have here is a Slack competitor. So timing is, is perfect for a Slack competitor. And we're starting simple. And so this uh, repository, this GitHub repository, has, a, has my Slack competitor, which today has very simple functionality. It's a React application backed by a database that has the ability for you to log in, add messages, and create channels. And so what I want to do in this example is uh, make a small change to that functionality. So before I show you what that change is, first I want to show you how I've set up this repository. You'll notice that there's a folder in here, and if I if I kind of uh, browse into here, you'll see start to see where my React uh, application is in the source repository. Um, and there's uh, I won't go into the the files there, but it's it's anything that you uh, would kind of expect to see, uh, JavaScripts uh, and CSS and HTML. 
What's interesting though, is this layer file. And so this is how we integrate layer CI into our repository. Essentially, um, this is an extension of a Docker file. So if you're familiar with Docker, this will look very similar, uh, very familiar to you. But this is the uh, definition within the code that defines how layer CI is going to build an environment and also run the reflect tests associated with this environment. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up a PR with a simple change that I have over here. The code change here is just a few lines. What I'm doing is I'm changing my uh, Slack competitor so that when I create a channel, instead of uh, when I click the create channel button, it, it automatically creates the channel. I now will prompt the user to click a confirm modal to say, do you wanna create a channel before uh, proceeding? Um, so a very simple change, but this is something that we definitely would wanna have test coverage for because it's part of a critical path, path workflow. Um, so we're gonna create a pull request here. And you will notice that once I create this pull request, um, we will start immediately running our layer CI uh, checks. And so let's switch over to layer CI here, take a look at what that looks like. All right. So within layer CI, layer CI automatically detects that I've opened up a PR and is now spinning up a new environment. Uh, to, to build that. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Colin to explain uh, what we're seeing uh, in this build. Sure. Um, so again, you know, CI at its really basic form is just, I wanna run a script every time a developer proposes a change. Um, and that script usually is, you know, does it even work? Like, can I even start it? Is there any obvious, you know, very broken syntax problems? Um, and also, you know, like run tests and things like that. So this, this layer CI configuration that Todd has made, what it does is set up everything. So it, it, we're using Docker for this application. So it runs, you know, it installs Docker exactly as it would on a developer computer. Um, it starts all the services exactly as you would on your developer computer. And then, uh, you know, one of these directives is expose website, which just means uh, make a persistent link to view what's going on in here. And yeah, you know, this exposed website directive is something you don't usually see in CI very much. Um, usually you detach staging servers from just running a test script, but you know, one of the, the features of layer CI is that you can combine these two. Um, and since the script is connected to the internet, you can run, you know, reflects, essentially like reflect pretends to be a user in their uh, script and then reflect can connect to this internet site uh, just as you would, and then it'll click through all of the actions, and then uh, it'll tell you, hey, you know, the one of the core workflows you wanted to, to try is now broken, and that's what we see here. So uh, Reflect has reported to us that one of our core workflows no longer works the way it used to, which is kind of what we expect because we've changed one of the core workflows. Um, and so I'll pass it back to Todd to show uh, what this end-to-end -end test has actually discovered about this workflow. Okay. So in the script here, we we're, have a URL to take a look at the results of our tests. So I will go over here now and do that. Um, and this is the linkage between layer CI and Reflect. And so what you're looking at here is Reflect, the Reflect dashboard. Reflect is a no-code test automation tool for website testing. And the way Reflect works is basically it simulates the experiences of the end user. And so in the context of our Slack competitor, we really wanna get coverage for our key workflows, things like creating a channel, logging in, um, uh, adding a message. These are things that a new user or existing user would do all the time. For new users, this is gonna affect your retention. Are people engaged? Are they bringing other people in, from the company into your application? Um, these are things that really have an effect on the bottom line. And uh, normally the way that you would set up end-to-end -end tests for something like Reflect is you would run them in a staging environment. So you would have a dedicated staging environment that you would deploy to you right before you deploy to production. Uh, you know, and maybe that's something that you do every week. Maybe that's something you do on demand. Really the power here in combining Reflect with Layer CI is you get that information on your changes immediately. And so what this means is that you can move faster because you now have confidence in every change that your developers are making, 
that um, you know things are working as expected. And so, as Colin mentioned, when he was going through um, uh, the explanation of what you were seeing on the layer CI side, we did detect an error and marked the build as failing because there is, in fact, one uh, test that is failing here. So first, what I'm going to show you is a succeeding test, and then we'll go to the failure and actually see what's going on. So I can click on any of these tests here and see test runs, some of the most recent test runs that we've run would then reflect. Every test run that you have uh, that we've executed shows what we call our test results view. What you're seeing here is a video of our test executor actually have gone, having gone out and executing the steps of this test. So I had created this test prior to test that I can add a message. I'll click play again so you can see it and uh, start from the beginning here. And we will actually, Reflect will go in and log in and verify that we can in fact uh, uh, create a message. So you'll see that in the video here. Those, those steps are synced up with English language test steps that you see on the left-hand side. Uh, and I can go into any one of these steps to, steps to see information about what we did. Um, so for example, in this particular step, what we're doing is we're validating that the text uh, test name with adding a message appears, but this section right here is dynamic, meaning that this message, which can change, um, should not be should not be included as part of my assertion. Uh, and this is important because there's many instances where you may want to be asserting certain certain actions after taking a certain action that something is displayed, but it may have something that can change over time. This is this in this case, this is a timestamp, but it could also be for an e-commerce site, the number of products in a category, um, or you know, the last time that you edited uh, a record in your application. So a pretty common scenario. The other thing that you'll see here is that we have uh, visual observations, which right now are toggled off, but I could toggle it on if I wanted to. And visual observations let me assert that something looks a certain way. So this gives you coverage. Within Reflect, you get coverage not only for uh, functional errors, like clicking a button doesn't do what you expect. It also gives you coverage for uh, visual regressions, things that users would still perceive as a bug, would still affect your conversion rates and the happiness of your customers, but um, would be hard to test in another kind of tool. So here in this section here, you can see the expected screenshot is, is this. Actual is what we actually saw when we ran this test. And then the delta is a pixel for pixel comparison. So if I had actually toggled this on, we would have marked this as failing. But the fact that it's toggled off uh, means that we're just kind of showing it to you for informational purposes. Uh, and the reason why it's different is because, again, that timestamp is different. So that's an example of a, of a passing test. We're going to take a look at a failing test, um, which is actually the workflow that we had uh, updated in our PR. So Right here, what I'll see, uh, I'll go in the middle here. You can see we're adding, uh, we've added a message, but now we are actually going to create a channel. And so we're creating a channel and uh, we're creating a, a random, a channel with a random name. So again, in Reflect, we allow you to get uh, coverage for things that would normally be um, challenging to do. You'd have to write code to do it. Uh, in Reflect, we can generate random values very easily, uh, allow you to do that. Um, but what we're finding here is that this last step is failing. Uh, and it's failing because there is, um, if I can play here, there is this new confirmation uh, that we're seeing. And so um, this is actually new behavior that we need to update in our tests. And so what I'm going to do now is actually update my test to uh, uh, reflect this new behavior. So I'm going to click on this test step that's failing and click on re record before this step. And this is going to show you what. Um, our uh, test recording experience looks like. So what, to create these tests, what I actually did is ran through the same experience where um, I, I gave it the URL that I want to test and I uh, clicked create a test. And what happens is we, in Reflect, we spin up a virtual machine in our cloud and that virtual machine is running an instrumented browser that will capture all the actions that I take over the course of the test. So what you're seeing now is that browser is actually running through all the previous steps up to the point where it validated that, uh, you know, the screenshot uh, of it that actually did create a channel. Uh, and now what I, I can do is actually go in and uh, add additional steps. So you kind of think of this as 
uh, to create a test and reflect, you just are simply uh, doing all the steps that you're doing manually today, uh, but we turn that into something that's automated. So I'm gonna click okay. And then I also am going to just add a, a test uh, message here uh, just to kind of demonstrate that. Um, so uh, we've added that. And now I'm going to update this test uh, because we have added the new behavior that we uh, are looking for. And I'll click update recording here. And now what I'm going to do on the layer CI side is go back and retry uh, from my last snapshot to retry all the tests. So we're gonna watch this here as it runs. And so again, just kind of explaining here what you're seeing, the reason why this is running pretty quickly is because layer CI has kind of intelligent caching built in into its platform so that um, if, if changes haven't occurred, uh, it will execute those fast and kind of fast forward you right to the steps that have changed. So we're seeing here that it's loading up uh, the, the new, uh, the same code and has kicked off uh, reflect tests, which are now running, uh, you can see over here. So we're running all the tests in parallel. And so um, what I'll be able to do now is um, we actually will be able to mark the tests as completed successfully. And uh, the build will be passing to indicate that yes, in fact, um, you know, that new behavior is uh, not only verified, but it's verified going forward for all the additional functionality or all the additional PRs that you have. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, in a matter of minutes, I've verified that my functionality is working. I've updated the tests and now we can merge and, and deploy. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it back over uh, to Lynn uh, for any Q&A that we have. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Todd. Uh, and thank you, Colin. That was an awesome demo. Uh, so we're actually running ahead of time, but uh, there's a couple questions from the audience that would be great to answer. So the first question is actually for Colin from Layer CI. So the question is, what's the difference between Layer CI and other alternatives such as GitHub Actions and CircleCI? Yeah. Um, so the the big difference is that you know Layer CI is made for uh, specifically like B2B and B2C companies working on web apps. And so our, our features are really leaning towards that use case. Um, like uh, this exposed website link, I actually just posted a link in the Zoom chat. Um, that would be like, you know, quite difficult to set up in, in Circle CI or GitHub Actions because you know, if you're paying for all of these uh, servers to run all the time uh, in like a traditional uh, you know, staging workflow. What ends up happening is uh, if a developer opens, you know, two pull requests a week and you have 10 developers, you'll have to have 20 staging environments running. Um, and that just gets, you know, untenable. Like as you, as your number of developers goes up, you don't want your, uh, your staging server costs to go up linearly with that. So one of the, the big benefits of layer CI for this use case is that the staging servers act as lambdas where the pipeline runs, we'll save the state of everything, you know, we'll hibernate the, the pipeline after it ran. And then when you click the link, we'll just wake up the, the pipeline and then forward your, you know, it'll look like a staging server to you. And then it'll just keep running. And then when you're not using it anymore, it'll go back to sleep automatically. Uh, but also, you know, even just the intelligent caching, uh, when Todd pressed the retry button, the Docker compose build took, you know, five minutes total. Um, and uh, a full Docker Compose build from scratch for that application takes 20 minutes. So it's just, you know, the, the feature set for building applications uh, like the Slack competitor or is much more fleshed out and much you know, simpler to use than Layer CI. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. Um, here's another question for you from the audience. So for Layer CI's layer files in particular, do you support adding custom directives to these layer files? Um, I mean, there, there's no, well, like, you know, it's it's a, essentially a programming language. So there's no way to add a syntax per se, um, but there is already a very set or very rich set of directives. So there's, you know, um, a button instruction that lets you do things like conditional deployments. Like you can say, uh, click a button to run the remaining steps. 
And that's great for things like uh, if you're using AWS, you can have a button and when you click it, it just runs your AWS deployment like you'd run on your laptop. Um, and there's things like, uh, uh, you know, like conditionals, there's um, cache directives. And it's all, it's generally all that our customers have needed up to this point to set up, you know, very feature rich staging environments. Cool. Thanks, Colin. Um, now there's some questions from the audience for Todd. So Todd from reflect.run, first question is, does this replace my unit tests? So um, when you think about testing, uh, I, the kind of common explanation of automated testing is that there's really three types of it. Um, the first is unit testing. And so unit testing is um, really small tests that are testing a function or a method or a class. Um, the second kind is integration testing, which is testing how systems kind of integrate with each other or, or testing against external APIs or something like that. And the third is end-to-end -end testing, which is testing the way a user uses your site, testing full workflows, you know, via web browser. We we do not replace unit testing or integration testing. So unit testing, there's a ton of great libraries for every language. Um, it's, um, you know, if you're doing TDD, you can still use T do TDD and, and use Reflect. Um, for integration testing, there's a lot of great uh, tools there. Docker makes integration testing uh, loads easier than it was in the past. Things like Postman is great for ABI API testing. What we um, replace <clears throat> are tools in the end-to-end -end testing space. Um, things like Selenium and Cypress. Selenium and Cypress are code-based tools. And um, really what our perspective is that we think that code is kind of fundamentally a bad abstraction for uh, how users actually use your site. And we think the best way to codify how users use your site is to use it yourself and record that and replay it. Um, and so to answer the question, no, we don't replace unit tests, we would replace Selenium or Cypress or, or things like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And here's another question for Todd. Um, so how do you update your reflect tests when they fail? Um, just because that's the example that you've shown. Yeah. So the example in the example here, we're updating them on every pull request. And so the updating a test, what I showed you is our re-record flow, which is actually fast forward me into the test, running through a couple steps, you know, I could run through a couple steps and record anything else uh, and, um, you know, update it that way. Um, that's kind of the power tool for editing a test, but there's other ways to edit a test too. If there was an input that needed to be changed, you can change that directly. Um, if there was a visual validation failure, so we detected it that, you know, a button went from red to blue there's actually a really simple workflow for you to go through and see all the, the visual changes in your test, say which ones are, um, are actually valid, you know, you know, actually was correct to change the color of that button. And if they weren't valid, then you would go off and, and open a bug ticket. But um, re-recording is really kind of the power tool for if you're making like larger changes in the code base that uh, would require extra steps, that's how you would, uh, would do it in Reflect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, we're going to turn it back to Colin now. Um, there's two questions in the audience. Uh, we'll answer the first one from Mohammed. It's on how long does this layer CI environment stay up and is it overwritten by the next pipeline run? Yeah, uh, good question. So layer CI's environments are actually per commit. Um, that, that link I posted in the chat like the, uh, the starting part is unique for that specific commit. Um, and, you know, the, I guess the workflow is you click the link, it wakes it up. Any actions you take, uh, it might change the state of the runner. But when it shuts back off, it takes another snapshot. Um, and so if you keep using a runner, they actually stay around forever, I suppose, because they're, they're deleted in a last recently used sort of basis. Um, so yeah, I guess it's per commit. It lasts about a week, uh, we'd like to say. And uh, you can even do fancy things like white labeling. So you could, if you're, you know, our domain is layerci.com. So we have something set up where main.demo.layerci.com goes to the most recent commit on the main branch. Um, but we can still access the commits from previous branches or, you know, earlier commits on the main branch to test if something fails, for example. 
Thanks, Colin. And uh, one funny question from the audience is, uh, Colin, did you build the st stairs behind you? <laughs> you have to say who asked this. <laughs> it's uh, Travis who asked this. Oh, I'm glad you asked, Travis. Uh, yes, actually, I got very lucky with uh, my timing and I built this loft uh, <laughs> right before the pandemic hit. And so uh, our, our house has been you know, 50 square foot bigger for the whole pandemic because uh, we sleep up here and then this is an office. Awesome. Um, now back to DevOps talk. Uh, so Ari, I uh, hope I'm saying this right, uh, asks, does this work with Kubernetes as well? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take this one as well. So uh, like everything we've mentioned has generally just been, if it runs on a developer computer, uh, like it'll run in this sort of process. So the, the thing we're automating is really like you'd have a, a QA person with a laptop running Linux uh, you'd set up your, you know, you'd ask them to check out the code in a pull request, like a developer proposes changes, uh, you check it out onto a Linux laptop. And then, you know, you, uh, you click through manually and you make sure that your workflows work. So all that Layer CI does is basically give you a developer laptop in the cloud. And so you can install Kubernetes in it with something like K3S. Um, and we have users that do that. And in fact, Layer itself runs Layer in Layer using K3S. Uh, so we make sure that we have test coverage with that. Uh, and there's a case study coming out soon. <laughs> and uh, similarly, like anything that you do as a user on a website, you can automate that with Reflect. And so if your core workflow is set up a Kubernetes cluster, deploy my application to it, and make sure that I can log in, uh, that would certainly be supported by the two tools. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much to both. Um, is there any final questions from the audience? Just want to wait another 30 seconds in case there are. All right. <laughs> Everybody's asking questions at the very last minute. Wonderful. So uh, Muhammad asks for Todd, how do your customers bake reflect tests into their CI in a microservice architecture? So um, with end-to-end -end testing, end-to-end -end testing is when everything comes together to produce a user experience. And so uh, whether you're using microservice architecture, a monolith, you, even if you're using a, a no-code platform, uh, you know, like Webflow or, or a bubble or something like that, um, at the end of the day, you're producing an application that your users interact with. And so what you're testing in Reflect is all of that coming together to, uh, to come together as one application. So to answer your question directly, you would deploy your microservices into um, you know, a layer CI, uh, using layer CI into one environment. And then that's how you would actually in a, uh, you know, interact with it via Reflect. Uh, it wouldn't be on a per microservice basis because your users aren't interacting with individual microservices. They're, in, they're interacting with your application.